Where'd you get these two guys from? Hello and welcome to a bank holiday episode of the Talking Sport Podcast. It's Daniel here, joined by my brother Sean. How's it going? And Sean, a busy weekend once again of action here. We're going to do a bit of a review of the weekend. Um, what were your thoughts overall, firstly, on, on a, a big weekend of sport? I guess badly needed at this kind of sort of time as well. Yeah, and, and I think it probably just, you wonder how you got through the original lockdown with no live sport when, uh, you know, you're, you're picking between different games to watch. I mean, you had the, the, the Dublin Hurling game on Saturday, you had the Manchester United Chelsea game. You know, Sunday came then with uh with the rugby as well all weekend and, and you know it's 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 more the same next week where when more and more of the the championship gets underway in, in Gaelic games and the Premier League continues and, and the Six Nations is gonna have its finale. So it's gonna be a another busy weekend of sport and uh, I think it's great at this time that you know people have something to talk about and look forward to. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll start with the Premier League to start with. Um, you wanted to focus on Manchester United versus Chelsea, I guess, before it was the game of the weekend. It didn't live up to the building. It seemed to me anyway that there are two managers, not just under pressure, but just sending out two teams to not want to lose. Now, while there's been nil all games before in the past against you know teams challenging for top four in Premier League, it did feel to me that this, this was a pretty poor game in terms of not necessarily the quality of players on show, but the actual managers and the way they set up their teams. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you nailed on the head. Two managers under pressure, two managers afraid to lose rather than wanting to win and put out a bit of a statement. And I think the two managers, they if you if you'd gone and had a meeting with them before the game and said, We'll take you yeah, both take a draw, they would have they would have both happily left the room and, and shook hands. And I think that's just the nature of, of the two sides at the moment. And I think it was one of those games that, you know, we saw after the the start, after Project Restart, where there was a couple of nil all games and games were really bad. And I think it was one of those games that, you know, if there's fans at Old Trafford, if there's 70,000 at Old Trafford, they're not letting their team get away with a performance like that because it was really, really poor. And, and there was just so little in the game and so little to, to talk about other than the fact that two managers relatively new in their managerial experience, although, you know, in modern times, it's they've had a, a, a year or so each now to really get their ideas into the players. And yeah, it was a, a really poor game. And, and you expect more, even if, you know, even if two managers set up like that, you know, you still expect someone on the pitch to show a bit of quality and maybe win the game. And, you know, Rashford had his moments. I thought Werner w- was, was really anonymous for, for Chelsea. And, you know, after his couple of goals against Southampton, you'd, you'd expect him to kick on now and, you know, maybe it's just the way they're playing. And, and I was surprised Mount didn't start Mason Mount and they went with the front three of Pulisic, Havertz and Werner. And and maybe is that the one going forward and then you leave Mason Mount out? I'm not sure. Still, we're, we're, we're talking here in six or seven games into the season, including Cup and Champions League, and Frank hasn't got his best 11. And I think the same could be said for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. And, and that's problems going forward because you, you can never go back to a system that you know works well. You, you, both sides have looked at five at the back. I think five at the back could, could suit Chelsea defensively because they've got Azbelaqueda, you know, who's so good defending in wide areas and, and that allows James to get forward. And I thought it worked well, but then they're, you know, a little bit short in midfield against a good side. So, you know, there's problems for both managers there. And the five at the back worked well for... Manchester United in um in, in Paris and, and you know maybe they go back to that in, in, in a couple of weeks but a very disappointing game and, and two, definitely two managers that are under the cuff Who do you think at the moment is set up for a, a higher finish between the two teams? I actually think United you know and I think they've just got that experience together in, in you know winning big games you know you think of the two Paris games Whereas Chelsea, I don't think they've, they've been together as long as the that United team have, have been on the road. It almost seems like it's been, you know, three or four seasons with the same faces and the freshening up of maybe a Fernandez and Maguire's come in, in the last couple of years. So, you know, I, I would think United, you know, if Chelsea can gel, you know, I think if, if both teams max out, I think Chelsea are probably the better side in terms of they've got more quality, they've got the better players. But at the moment, if, if you were to ask me who I think would do better this season who will finish ahead on current form and you know I'd, I'd go uh, Manchester United and I just think you know they had that ex- you know that little bit of experience of winning in in big games of being on the road together and, and look they've, they've got quality as well and they're just not both sides aren't utilising that quality and they haven't found a way of you know best using the players they've got you think of Manchester United you know to have 
I think 40 million of Donny van der Beek sitting on the bench week in, week out is, is not a good look. And it probably just goes to show you that, you know, Ollie probably didn't need him, didn't want him. You think of the, the depth they've got in midfield already and to start, you know, 32 year old Mata ahead of Donny van der Beek was surprising. Who I actually think could give them something in midfield because I think he's a, he's a box to box, if you like. You know, he can play 10 if he wanted to, but I think he's got a bit more and um, more about him to do that. And, and at the moment, you know, we, United are probably you know, lacking that because if they play McTominay and Fred, they're probably playing a little bit more, you know, defensively based in that sense to keep a bit more of a structure. And uh, they haven't at the moment found that front four then, if you like, to, to, to really take games to teams. Absolutely. A lot of problems there, I guess, in terms for both sides looking forward. Um, moving on to the Saints, Everton. We kind of talked about in the podcast, the lads and the Premier League predictions went for Everton. You kind of thought Southampton might cause some problems. Uh, the talking point of the... The game was Ancelotti saying James Rodriguez was out and then pr- pr- putting him in starting. So it almost feels like they were overthinking that a small bit as opposed to focusing on the game. I guess, you know, a small a lot of Everton's problems from last season kind of re- rearing its head. And I guess ultimately they still haven't sorted out those defensive problems despite the great start. Yeah, I kind of I kind of fancied Southampton. I thought it was a bit of a, you know, a banana skin for, for Everton because Southampton are a really good side and, and one of those sides that sort if they can get going in the first 10 or 15 minutes and maybe nick a goal or, or play really well, they can get on top of you and they can, you know, they're, they're set up well to hit you on the break or they're set up well to keep possession. And, and I think Everton at the moment, you know, following that that Liverpool game, maybe a bit of a jet lag from everything that's happened in the week and, and all the sort of talking points. And like you said about Hamez, who, who I thought would start once I heard he, he trained on Thursday and, and all those stuff kind of, you know, sometimes they can really work in your favour, but... You know, Everton just never really got going. Alex Iwobi on that left wing. I mean, you know, he, he hasn't lived up to the billing. 40 million, I think they paid. So, you know, you, you've got to see a return um, from that sometime. And and at the moment, you know, he, he he's a bit of a bit part player there. And, and, and he got replaced by Bernard, you know, quickly into the game. And, you know, things like that. And, and Everton were just, you know, I don't think they really got going. And, you know, Lucas Dean getting red carded is a huge loss for him because you think you know, Seamus Coleman is out on that far, far side. You might see them go to maybe a five at the back to to you know make up for the shortfall they have there at the moment. You know it's going to be it's going to be an interesting one in that sense because they lose so much of their attacking prowess when you lose Coleman and, and Dean, who you know the red card might get more than likely appealed, but whether it gets you know rescinded, I'm, I'm I'm not sure. But they lose so much because you think of the assist that Coleman and Dean get that the crosses into the box that the ball some set pieces so that's a huge loss when you've got someone like Calvert Lewin's heading ability absolutely I, I'm taking a small bit of credit for Southampton I know it kind of you know kind of gave up with them after particularly I think there was the I think it was even the Burnley win the 1-0 win I wasn't impressed with them at all they actually look quite decent it's the same things we were talking about before the season I guess it's just taking them a bit longer it's, it's mad how inconsistent they they are and I guess you know they were inconsistent for the last couple of years under half who's man but I guess this season more than ever it's probably it's probably not been as bad and they probably get a little bit more consistent but what are your thoughts on them and what's the limit of their expectations well I think their midfield is you know arguably the best you know if you look at in and around teams in and around them they've got you know Romeo who who was at Chelsea and just sits in front of that back mm. four as a screen and then you've got Ward Prowse who you know, is just one of those underrated players. And if he was playing for a big club, he'd, he'd be starting week in, week out. I think he's like, a, you know, a Jordan Henderson in, in that respect. I think he's got so much ability with the pass and range he has popped up with a goal on the weekend. And then you've got, you know, Stuart Armstrong, who who sort of plays off the right, can come in field. He's, he's been really impressive. And I think that's, you know, it took a little time for him to gel. You know, he came in the, the, the year previous, did okay at parts last year. Went on a bit of a run and, and now he's sort of at that disallowed goal, but he took the finish really well and, and he's been a really good sign. And then Nathan Redmond, who, you know, who's been one of those one of those Premier League players over the last few years who just goes under the radar, a bit like Ryan Bertrand. And they've a lot of really good, you know, professionals in that sense and players that have, you know, quite experienced in the league. And, you know, Danny Ings, who who's been around the clubs as well. And and yeah, you you would think if, if they can get a, a run of games going, who knows? And you know, they at times they 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 are really poor at home though, and I'm not too sure what what it is. But you know, you think back to some of the performances they've had in the last couple of years, even under Claude Puel, Pochettino at times, where they just you know they 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 just lose. It's, their... it's, it's a club thing more than anything, isn't it? It's just something... yeah, but sometimes there's that. I mean, maybe it's you know you think of uh, St Mary's, maybe the the not the most intimidating ground to go in England. 
maybe it's that maybe teams fancy it there away to them um, and can hit them on the break you know sometimes it's sometimes it's just that and you know if compare that to you know maybe going to to a turf more or, or going to a st james's park or you just you know you feel like you're, you're in a battle before the game start i mean you know, teams have struggled at st mary's but at times you know teams have have made southampton look foolish at home but i mean if that midfield is, is really the base um, and at the, and and the back four is you know pretty strong and the one thing you have to give credit to Southampton is every time they seem to lose someone, um you think recently of, of losing a, a Cedric on the right wing or you know they've lost Van Dijk in recent times and Schneiderlin and people like that they always seem to find a replacement they necessarily don't make huge marquee signings I mean I don't think many people would have heard of Bednarek and uh, Vestergaard and Wesley Hoop before they signed and and yet they always seem to do a job for Southampton and, and I think that's probably the, the basis of you know a huge amount of their continued stability over the last five or six years and ever since they've come into the Premier League they always just seem to like you don't think they've been had too many times in the transfer yeah. window uh, and I think maybe with the, exce- the exception of maybe a Buffal or you know a Lamina or hasn't really done it I think they've always really been solid in the transfer window and I think that that is a huge you know Graziano Pelle you know another prime example of that yeah, absolutely. I guess like I was kind of worried maybe for Southampton that you know sometimes when you're doing consistently selling players that sometimes it may catch up with you, but it seems like they've kind of found something. And even the signing of Theo Walcott there, you know, he's definitely someone that can impact off the bench. I know he started the last game as well, so there's definitely signs there that they could definitely give it a, a run and on a top ten finish and maybe even beyond that. Particularly with this season being so open, you know. But um, and on that openness, I guess we can move on and talk a little bit about Manchester City and and their disappointing one all draw. Another overall disappointing performance I guess from Pep Guardiola's team Sean yeah and you know I think they were just really sort of slow and, and lethargic for large parts of the game and, and you can't you know when we saw with, with Arsenal in the Leicester game you can't let teams settle and, and you know have something to defend come you know 20 25 30 minutes and, and and if you do that to teams they'll get they'll start creating and every team in the Premier League has the ability to hit you on the counter attack whether you look at you know Fulham or whether you look at West Brom or, or Manchester United, every team in the Premier League has has quality now and has that ability on the break. And that's probably been one of the big things in the Premier League. You know, when people say, oh, anyone could beat anyone now, and you think, and you look back at some of the results we've had in the last four or five years and, and you know, the competitiveness of the Premier League, it's probably to do with the, the, the money that's been spent. And every team has that bit of quality. Even, look, a couple of years ago when Fulham went down, they, you know, Sherla, you know, a German international playing uh, left wing for them. And and that's that's the the that bit about the game these days. Teams are so competitive, and West Ham have that on the break. You know, Jared Bowen, Pablo Fernandes, Antonio, like they're bringing Yarmolenko off the bench, who who hasn't not always the most consistent, but he's got an absolute wand of a left foot, and he, and he can cause teams problems. And Manchester City just let West Ham sort of sit into the game, and you know what a David Moyes team against the big side is going to do. They're just going to you know defend for your lives, and and they were really solid at the back. And Aaron Creswell, I thought. Uh, left centre back is, is doing an unbelievable job and I think you know so many teams are playing five at the back now and a lot of teams are going for that sort of out and out left back playing a left centre back because he can defy, de- mm. defend the one for example and, at Arsenal yeah exactly and you can get you can get forward a little bit more and you know maybe Creswell's legs have gone and he's not as quick as maybe he once was but he's still got that sort of defensive ability but he's also got a huge ability with his, his left foot crossing balls in and and you know, I thought that the Man City's defending for Antonio's goal was was absolutely shambolic. There was no pressing on the ball that came into the box. The ball literally sat in the box for an age. I think Garcia was at the front post, never even once tried to attempt to head it. And I think if he keeps his eye on the ball and even runs to, back towards the ball, I think he puts Antonio off. Uh, Diaz, I think, was the one that got pinned. And it was just too easy for Antonio to get, you know, to, to literally have a, you know, a free attempt at the bicycle kick and you know Manchester City you know every time you, you think of them you, you keep saying oh they're missing you know Laporte or they're missing De Bruyne but you know they spent so much money that you know that can't be they can't keep relying on that and, and they need to start winning these games and, and Pep Guardiola himself will probably look at it and think the last two draws away from home Leeds and West Ham Raheem Sterling's had chances in the last five minutes to, to win both games and, you know, Raheem Sterling two years ago, I think, after about six or seven games, had clearly, you know, won them points. You think of the late goals he scored against Southampton and Bournemouth on the opening day a couple of years ago. 
and six or seven games into the season, he's cost them four points, if you like, in those in those two away games. And and those are the difference between you know, that city side a couple of years ago and the city side at the moment. They just aren't, you know, winning those moments. And you expect a player of Sterling's ability and quality to to score those two goals. And all of a sudden we're looking at Manchester City top of the league. And and that's the difference at the moment, I think. And they could jail, but maybe it'll be too late and maybe the damage will be done. I mean, they're dropping points at will at the moment. Yeah, I guess just on that back five thing, I guess, you know, you saw Conte with a back five at Chelsea and a lot of teams would have copied it at the time. Seemed to almost go out of fashion uh, over the last couple of years, but it seems to get back, and particularly on that point you made about left backs playing the left centre back role, even thinking Kieran Tierney, Luke Shaw, Aaron Cresswell straight away, and there's multiple examples of that. Is is it is it kind of like keeping up with the Joneses sometimes in the sense that uh, you know if you see another team getting a bit of success with a back five, that it's as simple as a team copies it, and it's almost like it takes one team to play that system in a certain way for other teams to copy it. Like it just seems to me a bit simple that. Suddenly, all of a sudden, or like all of a sudden, every every team or a vast majority, a fair amount of teams are playing a back five outside maybe in Liverpool. You know, well, it, it, look at um, Newcastle uh, against Wolves. You know, two teams that played five at the back or play five at the back. And the thing about Newcastle is they played Jacob Murphy at right wing back, and now Jacob Murphy majority of his time when he started off in Norwich with his twin, they were both centre attacking midfielders. They can play right wing if you like. Now he played right wing back for, for Sheffield Wednesday on loan a couple of times last year and it just makes sense to have someone because you know when you when you sort of playing the championship and, and a lot of teams like Sheffield Wednesday sort of play with you know the old traditional two banks of four or a bank of five and a bank of four and as a right mid you're defending in wide areas anyway you know you, you kind of have that natural ability to, to sort of defend in those areas and when you're a white right wing back if someone beats you, you know you've got your right centre back coming across, and you know you actually got your centre mid who's not too far away from it. And I think that that's sort of working for a lot of teams at the moment. This this five at the back because you know they've they've got that quality to then you know have a transition where Jacob Murphy gets in a really good attacking position, and then all of a sudden you've got Ryan Fraser. So now you've got two attacking a bit, two attacking qualities on that right hand side. You lose the ball, then you still have Shar, you still have the sales. So it's it's actually a really good defensive balance and a defensive way of playing as well. You know, Sheffield United are a prime example of that. If you look at and the Stevens actually played left centre back in a three when Ben Osborne kind of played off the left. But every time they lose the ball while they're attacking, they still got Egan there, one of the other centre backs. They've got their two midfielders. Their right wing back isn't always far away, and that's sort of not a bad way of combating the press. And if you can win a high up, then You've, you've got the quality on the team. And I think that's what a lot of managers are going with. They're seeing it's working for a lot of teams. And it's sort of a quick fix, if you like. If you're conceding goals with a four, you add an extra defender in there, the sort of mindset changes. You've got three of them now. You've got a bit more cover. And you can actually be really assertive when the ball comes into a striker. You can really attack it. You know, you think of Dabo Luiz is so good at that when the ball comes in and he sort of wins it off a striker. And, and then all of a sudden you're in good positions to sort of have a transition. And I think that's what, a lot of sides are going at and it's sort of working and a, and a quick fix and who would have thought you know four or five years ago six years ago that David Moyes and Steve Bruce for example two managers are playing five at the back I mean it's sort of unheard of if you like and they're both getting really good results and I think that's it's just sort of it's sort of working at the moment for teams and maybe teams don't know how to break break them down I guess and yeah and sometimes when you have so many teams playing it you can see how good they're playing. You can almost learn from their mistakes as well and little things and improvements. So I guess that's a, a lot of it to, to do with it as well. But yeah, interesting to see now going forward how many teams do play with back five over a given weekend. Yeah, and I think, you know, a lot of sides, get, especially again, if you think of playing against, you know, an Arsenal team or a Manchester United team or a Chelsea mm. team six or seven years ago, you would not want to lose that midfield battle. And I think the game has sort of moved on now. The game's played in, in the final third a lot more than the, the middle third. And I think maybe that's the difference. Managers aren't afraid to lose that midfield battle and maybe they don't want to lose an overload on the wings. And I think that's probably the difference with, with modern day football in the last couple of years where if you say to Liverpool, if you're playing Liverpool, oh, let them, with the greatest respect, let their midfielders have it. But don't let Andy Robertson or Trent Alexander-Arnold get ball you know, in mm. space. And I think that's sort of the difference at the moment in teams. Traditionally, that would have played five in midfield and would have had three midfielders. Now, a lot of teams are playing with two. A lot of teams are sort of playing with one holding midfielder and uh, maybe a little bit more cover on the wings. And I think that's probably the difference. And teams don't want to lose the battle in the, in the, on the wing, really. 
is, is, is that a small part of why Manchester City is struggling? I guess they're so focused on that midfield. You know, you look at their team, the majority, they're, they're dangerous coming from that middle third, isn't it? You know, De Bruyne in there. And they can't quite get that working against teams now, whereas maybe as, as, as close as two years ago they were. Like, they've struggled for a good best part of two years now at this stage in terms of just week in, week out struggling in some big away games. And not even big away games, but games against teams the likes of West Ham where, or even Leeds United where they should be winning. Man City's problems, I think there's a couple of different Defensive. things, but you're right. Yeah, but they, they, Man City, if you probably look at their expected goals, and I don't have the stats in front of me, but they aren't creating as many clear-cut opportunities as they were two or three years ago. And that's, you know, to do with teams having more and more defensive cover and, and City aren't able to break them down and they aren't able to get more space. And you see a lot of sort of pot shots from in and out around the area, which is not Pep Guardiola style. And and, and that, that sort of typifies some of the problems they're having and they're not able to get in behind and, you know, they're not able to get the ball in the box for Aguera and a lot of their goals are coming from mistakes. And and there's another thing, once, once a team sort of finds out and a, another team and gives a template for other teams I think so many teams are going to uh, just look at that and I actually thought when I was watching the Sheffield United game and it was 1-0 and even one all and even at the end in my head I went geez that's the way to play that's the way to play Liverpool you know knock it long see what they're about get in second ball but play five at the back and have so much defensive cover on the wing and sort of shut out the space for for Alexander-Arnold and, and Robertson and, and make Mane and Salah come in you know, in field and, and look at they score a 30 yard screamer, they score a 30 yard screamer, but I think that probably gives you your best chance and, and knock it long and really test them out and have a lad like McBurney and have someone playing off him. And it worked. And how many flick ons did McBurney get? And I think that's just a template for other teams now to use. So, you know, when Liverpool go to Burnley or when Liverpool go to Southampton, maybe Southampton play a, a Shane Long or, or play someone a little bit taller and get second balls off them. And I think that's that's sort of what happened. That's happened at the City. They're, they're sort of getting found out, if you like. Yeah, and just on Liverpool's game then against Sheffield United, do you think it's, can they mount a challenge if teams do set up like that? Um, and you mentioned they there with Manchester City and teams finding the template. Was there a bit of a template there in Sheffield United? And has there been already? And I guess if a team, once there seems to be a way to play against a team, you have that example, uh, Exhibit A, you're showing on Friday before the game, seeing Sheffield United, this is how they played against Liverpool. This is how they got the results. You know, and for a team, I, you know, no disrespect to Sheffield United, there's better teams out there that will cause Liverpool even more problems. Yeah, and, and I tell you, if you ask Chris Wilder, what's the one thing his side really can't do is probably knock it long. They just don't really play like that. They don't have that sort of DNA about them. Yes, they've got runners from midfield, who I actually thought Sander Berg was, was brilliant on the night. I thought he was one of the best players on the pitch. And it, it looks a really good signing for Sheffield United. And yeah, look, Liverpool, teams would not have played like that two years ago when you're playing Van Dijk because, you know, a striker just won't get anything off Van Dijk really, you know. And that's probably the difference now. You, you fancy yourself up against Gomez and Fabinho, and there's that little bit more, that little bit more shakiness about them. Even you saw Gomez with Adrian, and a couple of times in midweek, and that sort of filters into the team. And there's a lot less confidence. And in the back of Alexander Arnold and Robertson's mind is normally when when one of the fullbacks has the ball on the far side, they'd be bombing forward. But in the back of their head, they might just be going there, I'll sit in, and they mightn't get that, you know, one or two goals a season, you know, difference when they have Van Dijk because they have that more cover. And uh, their midfield is a, is a huge problem without Fabinho. And when Alden was playing sort of deeper, I thought Henderson was really good. And, you know, he's someone that just, you know, must be licking his lips to be playing in that Liverpool side because, he, you know, he's a, he's a decent player. But at most other clubs, he would never have reached his full potential, if you like. And, and he's, you know, Klopp has really got the best out of him. And, you know, he was really, really good there against Sheffield United. And, and that's sort of, you know, if teams are to set up like that, Liverpool have really got to get their, their midfields and uh, midfielders getting into the box and creating opportunities. And uh, I think, you know, if, if you're breaking teams down, that's what you need. But, um, you know, definitely there's a template there to play against Liverpool now. There's a little chink in their armour, which wasn't there a couple of years ago. And uh, teams are going to get points off them. You know, Leeds should have got a point off them earlier on the season. Sheffield United, if you like, could have got a point off them. Although maybe a little bit lucky with the penalty, you'd, you'd won. Yeah, well, quick, quick word on that. Quick word on that. It looks like it was almost too much doubt there to say definitively that it was was in the box, but it was kind of yeah. tough to tell. I know a lot of Liverpool fans aren't happy about it. Yeah, and I think the problem with VAR is it was brought in for clear and obvious mistakes, mm. and you know the old 
you know, the old Thierry Henry handball where the ref just hasn't seen it, if you like. And those sort of mistakes that the Kieran Gibbs getting sent off instead of Chamberlain, those sort of errors, if you like. And, you know, when I was watching that game, I just, in my head, I went, oh, is it a foul even? It probably is a foul. Is it on the box? And then you're sort of looking at it from one angle and you're like, oh, like, come on, just get on with the game. Like, if it is a penalty, yes, it's a huge decision in the game. But, you know, if you have that much doubt over it and you're looking at it for, for that length of time and, and, you know, there's a question mark whether his back boot is on the is on the penalty or is on the line, you know. There's too much talk. There's too much questions already, isn't there, for like you're the, the fact you've come up with you know, a minute of talk in there and still haven't decided if it's a penalty or not to suggest yeah. that it, should, it shouldn't have been given. And, like, just give... Let let Mike Dean, who's the ref, and let, let let it be his decision, if you like. And yeah, when whether you know it's VAR or not, you just mm. go with the referee's decision a little bit more. Like referees are hide hiding behind the VAR, you know, they're not really being accountable for their decisions anymore, if you like. You know, if that uh, pick for tackle, everyone's blaming the VAR official. You know, when you look at him, Michael Oliver actually had a decent view. His lines of him would have seen it, and and I think you know they're just kind of hiding behind that at the moment, and. Uh, we are seeing, uh, you know, some really interesting VAR overturns happening at the moment, I think. Overall, I thought, um, you know, Liverpool did well to come back into the game and especially with, with everything that happened in midweek and, and, you know, playing three really tough games in a week, they they did well to muster a win out of it. Yeah, and you can definitely see a Liverpool team just sneaking and grinding out these wins. You know, they've been on the road a while and they're a very, very impressive side. But City aren't going to be pulling away from them. It's not a case that Liverpool will have to get to 90-plus points. So it'll be interesting. But from one VAR decision to another, what was your thoughts on the disallowed Arsenal goal? Do you think Shaka was interfering, interfering enough from Schmeichel for the goal to be disallowed? And would you have a small bit of sympathy for officials? for Because I do think particularly with the interference, they're very tough calls either way. You know, you can't really... It, it's it's one it's one judgment over another. Um, or do you think they dropped the ball again? It's just another example of VAR's uh, in, in, in adequate sea at times. VAR relies on different angles to to show, you know, the same incident, if you like. And sometimes people can get bogged down on angles and, you know, what looks a perfectly good tackle from one angle looks an outrageously bad tackle from another. And uh, the, the goal, I think, from, from the angle that was shown, it looks like Jacques really is in the, the way of Schmeichel. If you look from another angle, Jacques is, you know, standing up behind him. And, you know, those sort of things you'd you'd wonder and uh, yeah it's it's an interesting one because Schmeichel actually doesn't make any appeals necessarily at the start and that's normally a, a giveaway you know if a goalkeeper's not happy with it um then they'll make their appeals I think there was one with in the Champions League uh with Real Madrid I think there was another one with Chelsea recently and sometimes you know those things just you sort of get the look at the draw but other than that I thought oh, Arsenal were, were absolutely woeful you knew what Leicester wanted to do you knew you want they wanted to keep them in the game until you know Jamie Vardy came on and when you know I, I don't think people appreciate Jamie Vardy enough of what he does you know um, his goal scoring record you know to to start in the Premier League I think his first season was six years ago and to have 109 goals now level with, with gigs overtaking Peter Kraut's uh, uh, an unbelievable feat from him and, and you just knew what the right was on the wall from about the the 24th, 25th minute after Arsenal had started well and they, they didn't score, you, you, you knew Leicester were just keeping themselves in the game Absolutely, moving on to final word on the Premier League, Leeds United against Villa, what an absolutely unbelievable performance I guess goals aren't an issue for Leeds necessarily in the, in the Premier League and, and they, they disguise the limits in terms of what they can achieve, like without kind of getting ahead of myself here, there's so many teams uh, involved for top four, top six top ten finishes that I genuinely can see no reason why Leeds can't challenge for a very least top ten and moving on to top six and once you're challenging for the top six, you're essentially challenging for the top four this season, just given the way the league's gone, like again, who are the favourites of the league, Manchester City, they drop points this weekend, you know, Liverpool will probably jump, drop points next weekend and just keeps all the teams in it like there's no I look at this Leeds team, there's no reason they can't go away to a Manchester City or a Liverpool. It's not a case that they fear anyone. And maybe you talked about it before the season that the, the kind of struggle maybe against teams like Aston Villa are going away to Aston Villa where um, they may be expected to, to win. Or maybe Aston Villa are a bad example given the way they've started, but just those teams like to Fulham. But they've seemed to have the way to score goals. And they're not, as I said, they're not going to fear anybody this season. Yeah, I, this was the kind of game that... You know, I thought Leeds would struggle in and, and they sort of struggled at times in the championship and they sort of relied on late goals, if you like. <clears throat> in the championship, they just spat at them last year. But they were unbelievable and, and it was sort of the Patrick Bamford show. And, you know, he was someone that's been in and around, 
you know, Premier League teams. He's been involved with promotions with 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 um, Norwich, and he's played for Palace, and he's played for Middlesbrough, and he just seems to find he have the confidence. I think the the goal he got against Liverpool has done him wonders because it's it's sort of put him on a run now, and you know that. I mean, it was unbelievable finishes. I mean, that the second and third goal, that the second goal is just. You know, ridiculous. Uh, the defending is is horrendous to to give him that much room. The the third goal that I think is is just so good. Like you knew he wanted to get it on his left foot, and he sort of just he actually stopped. And then the the defender had moved. I think it was Mings again, hopeless defending for the goal. Like we we're seeing this. You know, I think defenders have have stopped actually defending. And and but speaking of defending, Luke Ayland's clearance off the line was absolutely unbelievable. I mean, that's a nil all, I think, or maybe one nil, and that sort of changes the game if it'll get a goal. And <clears throat> bearing in mind, he's a right back by trade. He's played right back for four or five years now for Leeds, and uh, that clearance off the line, and he had to move to centre back, and I mean, that's just the sort of performances that, that sort of get unheard of when, when a player gets a hat-trick, but, you know, hats off to Luke Aylin, who who's really delivering for Leeds, as he did in the Championship, and, and he's a huge player for them, and missing Cooper, now who's that captain, and Aylin slots in there, and, and they get a, a huge result, and it's, it's delighted for Leeds, because they're such a massive club, and, and it's unbelievable to see them back and you could imagine now if there was you know we said every week about Leeds but you could imagine if there was 3,000 away fans in that end at the end where Bamford scores his hat-trick goal and the celebrations and that's sort of you know that's all that's missing for Leeds and you hope you know that that Leeds fans whatever happens can get back and watch their side in the Premier League and games like that because you know they're actually a joy to watch and to be honest they could have scored six or seven and Villa were so open and yeah, they probably wanted to chase the game, but you know, Villa's defending. I thought, you know, for for being so good, and maybe they've relied on Martinez and Gold to to draw them out with big saves. But you know, some of the defending for the goal was was hopeless. Yeah, and I, we know a few Leeds fans, and I know they were putting up a few pictures of you know full stands and what it'd be like. And it, it does go, and the reality sets in a bit that you know sport isn't truly back yet, and until the fans get back, it never will be. And what we're watching at the moment isn't quite the same. But I, I think that's kind of heightened a bit with Leeds, and like you said, it's it's amazing to see. And I don't think any. If they used to go, they used to be the most hated club back in the day when they were so successful. But I think now, I think a lot of football fans really like seeing them do well, which I don't think Leeds fans are getting used to uh, at the moment. But we want to move on to have a quick word on the League of Ireland. And Shamrock Rovers winning it, similar to, I remember growing up watching Manchester United win the 2002, 2003 um, season and they won it without playing a game. And I just thought that was mad. And Rovers have done the same here to this weekend. But what's your thoughts just on Rovers? An amazing achievement. And I know a few people were kind of disappointed with the, the coverage in broadsheets on the Sunday papers. And uh, I think that's still a big deal to a lot of people. And there didn't seem to be enough coverage about it to catch people on the hop, maybe. Um, I actually wasn't 100% that they could have won the league this weekend. I just expected both to win, I guess. So, um, yeah, overall, what's your thoughts on that, first of all, and the coverage for the lack of coverage on the League of Ireland? Yeah, I'd, I'd, like I said, I think a lot of people expected Bows to be Finn Harps. Finn Harps, you know, just always seemed to churn out results. Though, and Ollie Horgan's done an unbelievable job with, with them to, you know, to keep them as you know they've been a yo-yo club maybe if you like, but to keep them quite stable. And full credit to to Shamrock Rovers. Um, what they've done, Stephen Bradley. You know, he's been he's been a manager. You speak about managers under pressure. I mean, he was absolutely under pressure at Rovers in a number of different occasions. You know, I think Dan McDonald tweeted that it was a game a couple of seasons ago where Gavin Bazuno played the goalkeeper who's at Rochdale now on loan from City. He played against, Gavin Bazuno played against Cork and, and actually saved a penalty and Cork were flying at the time and Bazuno saved the penalty and Rovers sort of just gone on a run from then really and, you know, the marquee signing the Jack Byrne, of course, you know, a player of that quality playing in, in the League of Ireland is going to make a huge difference. But they've actually got so much quality around Jack Byrne. Um, Aaron McAniff was an unbelievable signing from Derry. He's really slotted in. Ronan Finn to take him from the champions again. Brilliant signing. They've the experience of Joey O'Brien, Roberto Lopez from Bowes. I mean, Rovers have done really great business. Yes, they are one of the, the more financially stable clubs, so they can afford, you know, marquee signings, if you like. Dylan Watts from Bowes. I mean, it's probably if you like. And he doesn't even start, that's for example. A, yeah, exactly, and that's been a huge part of their success. I mean, taking players from other League of Ireland clubs and making them themselves better. And uh, I think that's you know full credit to Stephen Bradley because he was under huge pressure, and it sort of felt like if he couldn't win the league with this side, when would Rovers win it again? So but just, just just on Rovers, Sean, right? So you look at them and, you know, this might not be the best thing for the long-term competitive, or sorry, the short-term competitiveness for the league. But the fact that Rovers now have a B team in the, in the first division, 
Um, they've got a serious amount of squad. You mentioned take that Dylan Watts uh, example. He's a local lad near us, so we, we've kind of been following that. So he moved from Bowes. He can't even get into the starting lineup. So it shows the strength and depth they have. Does his Rover teams have the capability to really challenge them to get into a Europa League group stage? I know Dundalk made it this year, which was absolutely amazing, but I, I guess their limitations will probably be shown in the group stage or you know I mean I'm no Champions League group stage is probably a tad ambitious but, but maybe it isn't because the way UEFA changed things in terms of you see a lot more champions get in now do you think the Shamrock Rovers team are the best place champions in years uh, to challenge for a Champions League group stage place in the, in the, over the next couple of years and um, because I think what the League of Ireland's missed is a dominating force I know Dundalk were up there but they were always swapping it with Cork City and it always seemed that when it came around that whoever t- finished second the previous season was actually in a better place to challenge for Champions League except they were in the Europa League qualifying do you know what I mean it, it, do we have Rovers here winning the league for the next couple of years that could while short term not be competitive for the League of Ireland long term really grow the league here in Ireland if people are watching Shamrock Rovers in the Champions League yeah there's actually been a lot of debate about you know whether you take the three time I think League of Ireland winners with Dundalk around 2016 that sort of side that got to the Europa League or would you take the the Rovers team and if you actually look at a player for player they aren't far apart, really. You know, Ronald Finn was a part of both sides, but I think the difference was Stephen Kenny uh, and Stephen Bradley. I think Kenny's just got that little bit more experience. Stephen Bradley is extremely young. It was only 15 or 16 years ago. He was, you know, an academy graduate at Arsenal trying to break through, and, and that's sort of the difference at the moment that Kenny had that little bit more managerial experience with different clubs. He was over in Scotland. But no, you, you would fancy Shamrock Rovers, of course. They've got players, you know, even the performance they put up against that AC Milan, they need to play a team as, as good as that. It would give them huge confidence. They're probably missing a couple of couple of players and maybe an area or two that just maybe need a little bit more strengthening. You know, Graham Burke and, and Aaron Green up top have done well for them at times this season. Their midfield is really good. And, you know, defensively, Roberto Lopez has been you know, one of the most improved players in the league in, in the last couple of years. So, you know, they aren't too far off, if you like. And they have a lot of squad depth in, in certain areas uh, and it will be interesting to see but the, you know the big question is if, if they can keep their best players not only the likes of you know Jack Byrne but you know people like Lopez have been tipped with a move away and you know Aaron McIniff has been been so good lads like that who've been been at Rovers now for a couple of years if they can keep hold of their best players of course they can absolutely mount some sort of challenge at a European group stage and, and that needs to be the aim for them because not only f- as a footballing but financially I mean the rewards are unbelievable if they can get themselves there and uh, you know you would expect that would be the, the list on the priority as well as you know winning the, the cup and, and winning the you know winning the league again next year. Absolutely. And quick word on Cork City getting relegated. We, we spoke with Daryl Connor before for those that, you know, on, a, on an earlier podcast episode, if you want to check out the interview and it just, just doesn't seem to have worked out himself. It's actually, there seemed to be a bit of disagreement with himself and Cork and he's he secured a move to Cliftonville and pretty exciting move there for, for Daryl. But how do you see Cork for Cork City fans? It's a bit of a disaster. And it's, yeah, it, it, I don't know, you know what else to say really. It's just what an absolute fall from grace from challenging the likes of Dundalk for the league to getting relegated the same weekend that Rovers win the league. Yeah, I mean, it's... um. It's it's sort of even hard to to understand that the fall from grace, like you said, they've had and and you know they they maybe you know have, have had an over reliance on certain players at times. You know, Shawnee McGuire, Karen Sadley, players like that. Kevin O'Connor, who was who was there for a few years, and and they sort of tried to break away from John Caulfield's style of football, which is a lot more rigid, and he's doing an unbelievable job with Galway. You know, some of the results. I mean, they're in with a real shout of promotion, and it'd be you know it'd be really you know, interesting look if John Coffey be a full circle, in, isn't it? Yeah, and, and you know, they they in fairness to Cork that they, they're a really sort of progressive club and they're not really everyone's cup of tea in the league, but they have really, you know, tried to break from that style of football and brought in Neil Fenn who was sort of renowned for that sort of way of playing and, and it just didn't work and you know you have to the the short season is 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 a you know, a huge disadvantage to them. It's a disadvantage to everyone. Do you think that's and, fair? Uh, Ult- ultimately, to be relegating teams off the back of shortened seasons. I'm, I myself was surprised that it was accepted. Uh, I think at the time it was maybe to do with COVID-19, you know, COVID-19 when people just wanted to play and were accepted. But for example, RGA Championships, you weren't able to get relegated and we're a junior club. So why why is it different for a League of Ireland team? Like this is Cork City. If, you know, we get 6,000 6, fans that turn us across and they're getting relegated off the back of a shortened season. Seems a bit unfair to me. Yeah, and you know, maybe that's just what they'll look back on in, in a couple of years and it's a huge it's a huge thing. I mean, if they don't get promoted next year, which it, there's a high chance they won't, there's a lot of really good teams in that first division, you know, you think of Drogheda, 
you know, Bray, Cavendelia have been really good this year. Galway, like a couple of them teams have to go up. Oh no, and if one loses in the in the playoff, then all of a sudden it's it's a really competitive league again next year. So, you know, it's it is a huge shame for for Cork because last summer or two summers ago I was in Turner's Cross for European night and the place was you know it wasn't even a sellout like because that was that was the the problem at the time they hadn't really the team if you like or that the you know that that style of football to attract it you know an even bigger huge crowd but when they're winning the league I mean the the shed end and in, in Turner's Cross I mean there's no real place similar you know you think of maybe Daily Mount that's got that history Turner's Cross has that unbelievable history to it and uh, you know it is a, it's a huge shame and, and a real disappointment because um, you know they are such a, a massive club so yeah listen we hope Cork uh, get back there as possible well, because like you said we, we've experienced Sean of going to Turner's Cross a couple of times and it's, uh, it's an amazing fan base there and you'd, you'd the league needs that. The league doesn't need another Dublin club in the Premier Division. The league needs Cork City and a Cork team up there challenging for titles again. And, but, a, uh, and and if you know that there's been a little bit of talk about, you know, that the takeovers that have happened in recent time and some of the the issues that they've had, and, and there's a little bit of talk that some of them could be rearing their ugly head again. You know, Forrest, who are the the people who run Cork City, effectively, you know, they were putting up horrendous tweets about, you know you know, things that are happening and, you know, why they're relegated, if you like, and little sort of those encrypted sort of tweets. Uh, so, you know, you know, you hope for court that, you know, they stay stable and they stay and, and hopefully they get back to, to the to the top tier again. Absolutely. Yeah, quick word on Neil Lennon and, and Celtic and another draw there and they're, they're just been disappointing this season and the league could potentially already be moving away from them. I know we're so early on in the season, but... And, and, and I suppose it's the fact that Rangers look so good. You know, a huge win in, in the week in, in the Europa League, another win uh, against Hamilton or Livingston there there the other day. But, you know, Celtic were, you know, at times looked horrendous uh, and got themselves back in the game in sort of typical Celtic fashion. Lee Griffiths came off the bench, scored a brilliant goal. Then literally the next minute, a couple of minutes later, they win a penalty. And and, and sort of you'd hope they'd, they'd see it out and then they gave away... A, a sloppy goal, a penalty that really was sort of a last ditch tackle from McGregor, but how Celtic got themselves in, in that situation. And even our own Shane Duffy has been really, really poor for Celtic. And we spoke, and Ushin spoke, and we spoke about him. Maybe it'd be a good move for Celtic because they'll have more possession. And uh, he's, he's really struggled. He struggled in the old firm, you know, and, and, and it's sort of that form has fallen. They were disappointed against Milan. You know, I thought they never really they never really got at them and maybe they're missing that 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 sort of European night atmosphere in Parkhead and you know you, you would worry for Neil Lennon because it's a huge opportunity to win 10 in a row like it, it seems bonkers to think that Celtic are going to go into this almost if you like going to prepare they're not at full strength you know you think of how many times 10 in a row can happen and uh, you know it's it's a massive opportunity for Celtic to do it and at the moment Stephen Gerrard has Rangers playing really really good football and uh they they looked the team to beat early on in the season. Mm. You could argue the Rangers winning this season would probably be their biggest league win ever. Would, 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 would that be probably correct? Yeah. Like just given the magnitude of this, and it's been talked about the ten around for the last few years from Celtic fans. So yeah, it would be and, a massive and, achievement for Gerard on a personal level to you know. And, and just just before you come in, Sean, to Gerard, you, you look at him compared to Frank Lampard. He's gone on into a different, not different country, but you know, like to the Scottish Premiership. Uh, and he found it tough at the start, you know, and like they were, he managed to get them to a certain level, but couldn't seem to get to beat Celtic. And he seems to, the patience seems to be wearing and he, he could be looking at potentially top class manager there going forward. Yeah. And he stayed with, with, with Rangers, if you like. I mean, there's, there's a bit of talk of him maybe getting a job in the championship after his first year or two. And, you know, the way Frank could not turn the Chelsea job down and left Derby after a year, Gerard is sort of staying for the Rangers project to see you know, the real fruits of his work, if you like. And, uh, yeah, Rangers at the moment, Celtic are, are under huge pressure. Now, the, the one thing Celtic have is they have the experience, they have the players in the dressing room, the likes of, you know, Scott Brown, Callum McGregor, Lee Griffiths, who, who've sort of been there for the last few years, Tom Rogic, and they have the quality to win games. They just need to turn it around. And Neil Lennon needs to get something out of them. And, you know, Celtic are probably missing the fans. You know, you think about teams that really struggle without them and teams that do well without them. Celtic are sort of missing the fans because the, the fans would you know would not accept some of the performances. They would not have accepted uh, the Rangers' performance. And everywhere you go now on Twitter or Instagram, it's it's Lennon out. And you now to think that a manager is going for ten in a row and and fans want them out. It's Celtic are in a real bind. And 
it, like you said, Rangers at the moment, you know, you'd have to give Rangers full credit for what Stephen Gerrard has done there. Absolutely. That final thing on football, I think it's important just to mention the one 0 defeat from Ireland women's over the week the weekend. It was a really poor goal to concede and it was a bit kind of devastating watching some of the scenes after their defeat there. They still can qualify, but they've got to get something out of the Germany game. And Germany, like we mentioned on, on Thursday's or Thursday's podcast, is uh is a different level com- compared to the rest of the group. So it's not looking too good there for Euro qualification, which would be a massive disappointment. But, um, you know, it's still it's still hanging on by a tread there. But look, we'll move on to GA, Sean. I don't know, have you, have you enjoyed watching, how, how have you enjoyed watching the Intercounty? We spoke a couple of weeks ago about, in, you know, when it gets back, we, people get into the groove it again. How are you finding it? Did you enjoy watching the weekend's action? I think that's an important question to ask first. I think Gaz is a bit different to football. Um, I think it's important to kind of, how, how did you watch it? And uh, did you enjoy watching it? Um, at times I did. Um I watched a couple of different games. Um I watched the the, the Dublin Leash game and the hurling and at times I thought it was really good and at other times, you know, you're kinda of sitting there almost like it doesn't seem right now in Crow Park. You maybe get away with it a bit more because it's Crow Park and you know, you've seen games with very little attendances there in the past. But, you know, even still there was a little bit of a a weirdness to the night and I suppose it was the same when football came back and other sports came back where, you know, for example, I didn't watch the Bundesliga. I didn't think I could watch sport without fans. And so it's gradually by gradually, it sort of brought me, you know, won you back. And I suppose hurling is, is one of those sports that sort of drives off the atmosphere and everything that it brings about. And um, it, it was sort of... What do you think of the crowd noise? It was a bit... It was, it was sort of a crowd noise, I think, with like a National League game or like a an Aussie rules game where it's sort of generic noises if you like there's no come, come on the dubs or there's no shouting at the ref or things like that and you know you wanted loads of leash 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 chance or proper get the hair your yeah, yeah. kind of thing yeah yeah those those sort of things maybe add a little bit of spice to the game but uh, Dublin were, were really good and, and they were big favourites going into it and it was sort of if you like it's sort of a real banana skin for them because you don't know how sides are going to react but that win will really give them confidence now against Kilkenny and there's a real chance for Dublin to beat them now they sort of seem to have sorted out a few problems Donald Burke is back this year after going uh, I think it was in the States last summer so missed missed the championship and, and that's a real plus because he was he was really really good even from play some of the skill he showed and uh, the goal he took was was a really good goal and and that's sort of someone that you know Dublin have always had a you know a good free taker in, in David Tracy or Paul Ryan played but I think you know, Donald Burke and, and the confidence he'll get from, from his from his tally from play as well, but will really impress him. The interesting one is Davy Kell around and Hayes in that full forward line. It's a really young full forward line, if you like, with, with Burke, Kell and Hayes, three players all under the age of, of 22 or 23. Now, whether he sticks with them against uh, Kilkenny or whether he throws a, a name and Dylan in there, whether he throws Trollier in there and see, you know, Trollier can cause the the Kilkenny backline problems. Uh, he took his goal really well. He's been in great form for his club, named for named for Mbarra. And um, so, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see something like that. But overall, I thought Dublin were, you know, were pretty good. Still a level off, you know, the top counties. But I still think Leinster has opened up, if you like, for them. Uh, they're a game away from the Leinster final. You know, who's to say they won't beat Kilkenny? And the game and the sort of match fitness will give them a huge amount of confidence and a huge amount of something going forward where, you know, they could be playing Kilkenny and coming out of the long grass, if you like. Yeah, I, I think it was a Donald Burke's point he got uh, on the left sideline towards the end about 10 minutes ago. I thought that was un- unreal. And I think, uh, yeah, it was it, well, it was nice to see. I guess, like you said, Crow Park, was it was nice watching. It was a bit weird with the crowd noise. Uh, I did think Dublin probably need more goal chances or create more goal chances if they want. I think Nicky English mentioned that in commentary as well. But um, yeah, I think the hurling kind of, you know, it's knockout already. I guess the guys probably another week away for, sorry, the guy being Gaelic football. Um, you want to come in there, sorry? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, Dublin's bench has that little bit of something now, whereas they mightn't have had that a few years ago. And I think bringing the likes of um, Mark Schutte off the bench, Trollier, you know, players like, that they've got a little bit of experience. Jake Malone, who you know is a really good midfielder, um, and and came on and, and did pretty well um, in the short time he had. But I think their bench might give Dublin that little bit of something. And the the running in the legs, you know, I don't think you can understate that. And and the same for Limerick. Absolutely, yeah. With Limerick, a quick word: do you, do you have them as fabs? Uh, I think they're the bookie fabs for the the championship. Do you, do you agree with that? Do you think uh, uh, maybe be a small bit overreaction to their performance, or do you see them really being one of the top teams in the country? Yeah, no, I think I think they they were they'd be my pick again. 
got that running in the legs, that match sharpness, but I mean, they're unbelievable and, and they've just got so many good players and they, they haven't changed anything from the side that, um, the side that, uh, that won the All Ireland that they brought in a couple of little new players, um, national cornerback line, and who, who's been there the last couple of years, the, the Casey's, you know, Dan Marcy, you know, just unbelievable players. And then you've got the scoring ability they have. I mean, I don't think it's, it's matched. You know, Dermot Burns, Garou Kegarty, you know, guys who can score points from any angle on the pitch, and, and you can't understate that. And Limerick always just seemed to run up tallies. Uh, and it, and if Nicky Quaid can have a good year this year and, you know, keep sides out, Limerick have to be favourites, I think. And so much ability, um, Aaron Galan, you know, players like that. And all of a sudden, you know, Kyle Hayes, and, you know, that Limerick side has the experience of winning in all Ireland. And, uh, you know, it's sort of a lottery this year with, with the knockout games. But, you know, I would fancy Limerick. I thought they were unbelievable. And a quick quick word on Tony Kelly as well, because Tony Tony Kelly carried that Clare side. And I saw a tweet, and it was sort of almost disturbing that, you know, he was 19 when he won uh, in 2013, when he won Player of the Year, when they won the All-Ireland. I mean, he is an unbelievable hurler, uh, someone that doesn't get enough credit, maybe because he plays on that Clare side, and, and he just seems to drag Clare through games, and there's a huge over-reliance on him. But he's a, he's an unbelievable hurler, if, you know, one of the best, you know, definitely with, with with the slitter in hand in, in the country, that's for sure. And then moving on to Kerry Tyrone, in particular, they're the two kind of performances you want to talk about in the football and in the bigger picture, I guess, uh, in terms of challenging for the championship. Do you see, um, who, how do you see those two teams are fair? And um, Tyrone obviously got that massive game against coming up against Donegal and Kerry, um, Kerry will have a Munster route, I think Cork semi final and um, more than likely Munster semi final. So, how do you see those two teams and what were your thoughts on their performances there over the weekend? Well, well I, I called highlights of the Kerry game and, and you know, the, the standout again is David Clifford and it just, you know, once you have a David Clifford in the side, you can win, you know, we can win any game almost if you like and, and they've got a lot of other quality around them and you know, one thing that was sort of noted and, and some of the articles I read is Kerry weren't afraid to go into a defensive shape as well and they sort of weren't afraid to flood men behind the ball and I think it was Shane Dawson on Air Sport interviewed Peter Keane who's not, not always uh, not always straight talking at the best of times and you know, we'll clip it on Twitter, but Shane Dawson said, geez, you weren't afraid to put 13, 14, 15 men behind the ball. And Peter Keane said, oh, oh, oh Jesus, did we? Oh, oh, you'd have to count that again. And, you know, <laughs> I, I think Kerry, uh, Kerry, Kerry are really fancying themselves this year for a real crack. And I think they, they, they're trying to show what they have. And it's been a huge thing about them that, you know, defensively, they've been poor in the last couple of years. And Pat Spillane did a piece on the Sunday game a couple of weeks ago about, you know, them not being afraid to defend in, in numbers. So it's, it's obviously something they've been working on during lockdown. And, you know, why wouldn't you work on your defence when you've got, you know, David Clifford, Sean O'Shea, players like this that have just got unbelievable scoring ranges. And, uh, you know, I mean, David Clifford can win games on his own. It's as simple as that. And, you know, I don't think anyone in the country has learned how to mark him. I think there'll, there'll come a time when, you know, David Clifford gets found out a little bit. But I think, you know, players like David Clifford will just find a way. And, and I think that's that's the difference at the moment. And uh, just watched a bit of the Tyrone game as well. And I thought that was sort of a, a way that, that Tyrone haven't played. And I know people like Joe Broly were, were waxing lyrical about them. They sort of played a little bit more direct at times. I mean, the goal, uh, Peter Canavan's son gets uh, the pass from Conor McKenna, who slotted back into Gaelic games from the AFL. It's just what you'd expect from from a side that have so much football ability now. And Lee Brennan as well, who I didn't think played, you know, and all of a sudden that Tyrone team, if you can get players like him back, they, they've got a real something about them going forward, which they haven't had. And they've been lackluster in the last three or four years. And that's maybe stopped them from winning in all Ireland. But, you know, who's to say if they beat Donegal, they take their confidence into Ulster, they'll take a lot of stopping. I almost want to do a Dublin Kerry preview already and just talk about or even review of the two All Ireland finals and how they'll change their shape and how thirteen or fourteen men behind the ball looks against this Dublin team and what's different from the the, the game and the replay because we were lucky to go to both those games last year. They were just phenomenal occasions. It just I just can't wait for that game to come out, go ahead if it does it. But again, there's a lot of water on the bridge before that, particularly like you mentioned, Donny Gone Tyrone. Final word on Mayo getting relegated to Division Two, I guess in the in the madness of all this behind closed doors, and Mayo will give uh, Mayo give the championship a right go. I guess it's a massive disappointment to be in Division Two, and I don't think it's ever lost that while teams didn't take a lot, the Division One too serious overall over the last few years. It's always looking like Kerry would always try to make sure they didn't get relegated. Donegal the same, although and they did have one year, and I actually think that set Donegal back a small bit getting relegated to Division Two almost a year down the line, an extra year of not playing competitive those competitive games. They are massive, aren't they? Yeah, it's it's a it's a huge loss. Mm. 
for Mayo, I don't think it can actually be understated. And like you said, with, with everything that's happened, it does it seem a bit unfair that teams get relegated in, in the year that is COVID. But I think they, for Mayo, they sort of rely on those big games of bringing teams to Castle Bar and really sort of trying to hurt teams. You think of some of the games they've been doubling over the years, Kerry. And now it's going to be a huge loss because, you know, Castle Bar is one of those places in Mikhail Park that can host games under the floodlights on a Saturday night and uh, I mean it's going to be big for even the product that is the Allianz League uh, and for Mayo such a big county to be in Division 2 with the support they have is a, is a massive loss to the, to Division 1 um, and it's going to hurt them next year um, whether, whether it hurts them this year who knows uh, I think they'll give they'll give a crack go they just don't seem to be firing as much as maybe maybe they, they shoot summer football a little bit more you know it, that can't be understated the difference between the quick pitches and the slow pitches then the wind and the rain and I actually sort of like things like that can't actually be understated going into the championship and, and what team can deal with the wind and the rain and, and you know use the wind and a half you know Galway just against Dublin didn't use the wind in that in that first half and and but sometimes it's about blitzing a team with the wind in, in five or six minutes and getting three or four scores and really, you know, changing the game. And, and it's, you know, it, it is going to be interesting to see what happens this year where, you know, playing an All-Ireland final, hopefully, and, and there was it the, the first, the, the last Saturday before. So yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh, yeah, I actually need to double check that into the dates. Again, it's the madness of it all and this, these dates are decided. But uh, yeah, it's Christmas All-Ireland finals and... I guess look, it'd be great having them to look forward to over the next couple of months. And I think when the championship gets into action, I, I hope, like given everything that's going on, that we can we can go ahead safely. And um, yeah, like at the end of the day, and we can just start giving out about referee decisions. You know, I'd like a bit of that in the gap. I think that's important. And uh, like I said, and football's a fantastic sport, but you know, it's Premier League stuff. League of Ireland's been great and all, but Gaz is, is ultimately an Irish sport. And I think it's uh, it's great having it back, you know. And I think it can, it can just change the that's why people have been so vocal for it to come back because it changes the national conversation and you know it gives life to to a time where you know people are really struggling with all sorts of things and all sorts of problems and i think the ga has maybe just brightened it up and the fact that there's so many games on tg car rte sky you know if people have you know a basic sky subscription they could have watched the dublin east game and you know i think in that sense it makes sense that everything is is being played and you know, hopefully everything goes safely. And, there's, and you know, we sit here and on the week before Christmas and we're all looking forward to an All-Ireland final and no one's talking about some of the stuff that has happened maybe with COVID or anything. And, and I think that's the big challenge for the GA. And, you know, if, if, if it can help people through it, you know, I'm sort of slowly coming around to the idea that should go ahead. And, and I have been a little bit sceptical, but I think if it can be done in a safe manner and, and players are getting tested regularly and, you know, there's no big community um transmissions because of the ga i think that then then why not let's let's see it happen absolutely and uh, this has been a long podcast i guess the the weekend's action the more and more sport going on so we can only apologize to rugby fans it's taken this long to talk about ireland against italy pretty solid enough performance from ireland sean i guess you know we're gonna have a proper six nations final weekend now this weekend i'm actually genuinely really looking forward to it 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 was a bit weird watching the ireland italy game saw bits of it um it was just great seeing, yeah, it's great without being kind of too basic, but a great seeing the lads back in terms of watching an Irish team and a uh, couple of impressive performances uh, as well from Ireland. Yeah, a couple of good debuts. Will Connors, uh, Hugo Keenan, you know, really sort of standing out and, and sort of giving them that little bit of taste of, of Six Nations rugby going into, you know, what is going to be a different ball game in Paris, that, that's for sure. But you now a little bit disappointing to end on losing a try like that, considering that Ross Byrne had, you know, taking a quick drop goal for his conversion to try and squeeze another try in for for the goal or for the points difference then that could come down to it, uh, next Saturday. But now, uh, look, it was it was it, like I said, it was it was funny seeing them back and even seeing you know the Aviva for the rugby and um it's it's one of those sports that crowd noise is actually I thought worked really well because yeah you know, I, we, we watching the game as well I thought that was exactly what I thought the crowd noises were phenomenal and it, it, you know it's great it's weird you have to kind of sober yourself up a bit to say you know we're getting brainwashed again by crowd noise but yeah I I genuinely completely agree I thought they were very good yeah because it's such an intense sport anyway and because there's so many you know hard hits and and action at the rook and the breakdown I think that you know the crowd noise has sort of helped it a lot and. Ireland can scrape the 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 championship because of um that everything that's happened it'll be unbelievable but uh no it it was a it was a, a decent performance and like you said a lot of things to work on but a lot of really good debuts and 
you know there's the, the thing about it is you know there's a huge amount of selection problems you know Peter Armani didn't start he came on bull and you could see it and and maybe that sort of suits him the off the offload was, was unbelievable but even you could see he was real pumped up for it Gary Ringrose broke his jaw so he's going to be out but Robbie Henshaw came on and, and obviously didn't want to be sitting on the bench so he came on fire and, and I think it's a good sign and uh, Jacob Stockdale of 15 is an interesting one I he played he played okay you maybe lose a lot of his attacking quality on the wing um, but he sort he's playing a lot more there for Ulster and maybe it's a position that both club and country are going to morph him into and and he dropped a couple under the high ball and, and that's a huge thing at fullback he, you know you think of Rob Carney under the high ball being you know so solid and that that's that's going to be an interesting to see whether France target him or uh, what way France set up. Yeah, absolutely. We're looking forward to the final weekend. We'll talk a lot more about it. Um, listen, appreciate everyone listening to get to get this far in the podcast. Um, we are kind of looking at maybe separating the the football show and and the other sports to talk about a little bit more in depth to them. But um, yeah, Sean, really appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Uh, we we're excited to bring you on Wednesday. Aon or Reardon. And um, this is a brilliant chat. Really, it's gonna it's another long one, but we're talking a lot about. Um, we mentioned this last week in terms of you know women in football and um, and just sport in general. You, you, Relieves a lot of his memories of Italian 90 and Euro 88 and USA 94 and it's brilliant and then we, we just it's just conversation really just of, just about sport and the importance of it and a few other deep topics that you know off the back of it, we can maybe have a few episodes on as well so we're really looking forward to bringing that to you that'll be in your podcast feeds very early Wednesday morning uh, and all I have to say is yeah get in touch with us at Tackling Sport on all social media if you've any ideas for the show um, and yeah all I have to say is goodbye from Sean Bye. And goodbye from myself. We'll chat you on Wednesday. Uh, have a great week. The world's made up for you. So take advantage and be happy.